failure is just feedback to him on what he needs to continue to grow and develop. In other words, it's all part of the process. I think when we say failure, kids interpret it, people interpret it as it's it's an end. No, failure is just part of the process. It's part of feedback to grow. Greg, welcome to the Generation Youth Podcast. Thank you for being my guest today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I really appreciate being here. Well, it was nice of you also to this past summer, uh, summer of 2023, if someone's listening to this in the future, that you were a part of the inaugural Igniting the Next Generation Summit. So I do appreciate that. That was a great success, and I valued your contributions to that. Yeah, thank you. It was a, a really neat event. It was awesome to be a part of, and uh, I just appreciate the the experience to try to impact young people as best as I can. Well, one of the things I really appreciate about about uh, having you as our guest on the summit and now as the podcast is the experiences that you have because you have had all different aspects of working with you. And my audience would gets tired of me telling them about our guests, so they would rather hear our about you from yourself. So if you wouldn't mind, share a little bit about yourself with the Generation Youth audience. Sure. Uh, Again, my name is Greg Berg. I've been in education for 29 years in a lot of different uh, realms. I started out as a teacher, uh, taught math for 10 years. I've had this passion for leadership my whole life. Um, I was also a coach. I was a coach at a very young age, a varsity coach at age 26. Really started coaching in college. So I I was a varsity boys basketball coach, teacher, had this drive for leadership, uh, became a high school principal at age 33, um, and had to get out of coaching, uh, which was probably one of the tougher decisions I had to make because I was kind of in my prime. I was young. I, you know, we had some good teams, some great kids, but I I had to take this next step and take kind of that, that risk uh, to jump into leadership. And so I got a, a principal job at a neighboring school district. I was there for two years and I was able to come back. To Lake City, which is where I, I started. And I've been the principal there for now. It's my 17th year back in Lake City. So unique. I, I got the opportunity after being back in Lake City for a few years to get back into coaching. And so I've now been a varsity basketball coach and a high school principal simultaneously for the last decade. Uh, we've been very fortunate to have some, some great teams, a uh, real strong program. And I think what's unique about my background is From a coaching perspective, you know, I've seen this as a young coach. I got out of it for a while, kind of reflected. Uh, I got back in. I do certainly some things a lot differently. We've had a lot of success, Uh, but I've seen it from an administrative angle. I've raised two kids. I'm an empty nester uh, this year, just started. So I've really seen the whole growth and development of of kids and sports and a lot of different perspectives. And I, I think that's really driven my desire to kind of write online and and speak and present and do all the things I'm doing today. Well, I love your focus on working to help develop young leaders. And as a byproduct of that, or maybe even as another aspect of that as well, developing adult leaders as as they seek to impact youth. And when I was preparing for our time together today, one of the th- things that really... Uh, just run true to me was my, my son was a, a high school athlete, played a lot of different sports. And the last uh, really big focus of his life was football. And when he first made the varsity team, very talented team, talented quarterback, talented receivers, they did had moderate success. Next year, quarterback wasn't as talented. Receivers, they were as good. Probably the defense wasn't as talented. They had much better success. And so I asked him, I said, what did the coaches do differently that year? He said, the coaches didn't do anything different. He said, it was the same game plan, same everything. He said, it was not much different at all. Maybe a little bit of moderation because this quarterback couldn't run, you know, and the other guy could, you know, tuck and run. He said, I said, so what was the difference? He said, dad, the seniors were leaders. He said, last year, the seniors were arguing, arguing at each other all the time. This year, the seniors were leaders. He says, last year, the, the juniors hated the seniors. He says, they couldn't stand it. He says, and they didn't fight, but they, you know, they didn't get, they weren't together on a team. So that struck with me about that. Why, why is there such a deficiency in young people in, in these leadership areas or skills? Or what do you see as that kind of leadership uh, problem that we have? 
you know, you hit the nail on the head where player led teams win. And so I, I reflect on my experiences as a coach. And I would say as a young coach, as a 26 year old coach, I am replacing a hall of fame basketball coach in, in Lake city, wow. Minnesota. Um, you know, I came in and, you know, I, I had all these principles I was going to teach and I was more focused on the game. Okay. You know, when I'm 26 years old, I think that's pretty normal. And what you end up finding out, you know, over time, what I found out is number one, a coach's primary job is to develop culture on their team. And number two is to develop player leaders and the basketball and the X's and O's and everything that, that, you know, you, you think about when we think of coaches is all after the fact, because if you don't have a, a strong culture and you don't have player leadership, it really doesn't matter what you're doing from strategy and X's and O's. That stuff is going to trump that all the time. And if you think of when coaches get themselves in trouble, it's not because of the offense they're not running or or this. It usually comes back to there's a culture issue in their yeah. program or there's a lack of leadership that causes other things to develop and grow. So player-led teams win. And so my big drive and what I've been you know writing about and, and talking about for a long time is how do we get to that point? How, how do we get great player led teams? How do we develop leaders and young people year after year? Because as a coach, you know, there's two things I know. One player led teams win. Number two, we can either wait, wish, and hope for leaders to show up at our door, or we can try to systemically do something to grow and develop them so that we have that year in and year out. When I think of our success in our basketball program, and people have asked me, you know, what why have you had the success you've had? And it comes down to, we have a, a strong culture that's been there for a while. Okay. Before me even, but we've had great player leadership year after year after year we've had in the last decade, we've won our conference nine straight years in a row. And in half of those years, we've started a freshman or a sophomore on our varsity team. Wow. And that's impressive. And that's not normal around here to start a, a freshman. I mean, we have good basketball in this area, but that only works if your seniors and your leaders buy into that. You know, obviously those freshmen or sophomores have to be ready. They have to prove themselves, but that only happens when you have good leadership on your team. And we've had that and we've developed it and it's not something that just happens. So, you know, one thing I've created in the last few months is a product called the Team Leader OS. It's a huge, it's 300 pages of resources. It's 200 minutes of video. It's for coaches to try to develop and grow leaders on their teams. Mm -hmm. um, I have a school version of that and I'm coming out with a parent version too, where a parent could get this for their child to at home, teach their son or daughter how to grow and develop as a leader to try to make an impact on their team and their school and their community. So that's something I'm passionate about. And, you know, we could talk a, a lot about uh, the different aspects of leadership, but in a nutshell, player led teams win. How do we get more of it? I love that you're right, uh, also coming out with a product that parents can use because I was thinking as we were get, starting our conversation, there's somebody that's listening. That's going, Oh no, James has got another guest going to talk about sports stuff. I'm going to, I'm going to turn this off, keep going. But Leadership, developing leadership is so important in young people. And if they'll just look at sports as being the laboratory where we can test out and find out what works. I, from my perspective, and I'd love your feedback on it as well. I think it's, it's it because it's uh, like it's like putting something in a microwave versus a slow cook. You know, you put a, a sports team is, you know, it, it heats it up. It makes it more pressure. It, it causes things to happen faster than it might in normal life. So those principles that are happening on the field and on the court, they're the same the ones that they're going to use in life. Uh, I, you, and I love your analogy because it is so true. I often say that team sports are the ultimate lab setting for life. Okay. And, you know, I'm a high school principal, so it's beyond team sports. There's a lot of activities that you can be a part of. It's band and choir. It's being in the play. It's, it's being in different clubs and organizations. They all teach these skills that are incredibly important. And, and it's unique to being in the United States because we have these embedded in our school system each and every, mm -hmm. every year. But sports, team sports, puts it at another level. And I, I love your analogy with the microwave because I can guarantee you when you're part of a, steam, a team sport, stuff's going to happen. 
I can guarantee there's going to be a struggle. I can guarantee there's going to be adversity. I can guarantee you're going to have to sacrifice your role or what you want for the good of the group. And these skills and how to teach resilience and how to deal with adversity and how to sacrifice and how to be a part of something bigger than yourself are critical skills that are in all fairness are starting to lack more and more with kids and and in our society today. And so that's why team sports are so important. And that's why all the data points to kids that participate in these activities go on to leadership positions later in life. Mm -hmm. And I really attribute it to all the skills they learn in these lab settings that are messy. You know, we, we talk to parents all the time. Um, there is going to be a struggle. I guarantee you accept the struggle. The struggle is part of the process and we want to guide kids through the struggle, but you'd rather they learn and deal with the struggle now when they have supports in high school than to first get that struggle when they're 19, 20, 21 years old exactly. and they don't have a support system around them. And now they don't know how to respond. And mm. that is so critical. And I see that as a principal and as a coach all the time. I, I love that. I love what you said, being able to have it there. I was very fortunate not only to have participated in some sports that had some coaches that maybe they weren't the world culture changers, but they allowed us to do things. But I was also involved with a student organization called the FFA, which yep. I think really helped me and develop my leadership ability in a very intense level. And one of the things that really concerns me is when folks say, I don't want my child to participate in something like a sport activity because I'm concerned with their uh, health and they don't think about all the other aspects of it. Oh, I, they may get hurt. And, and granted, that's a concern that they could have, but th th there's just so much out there that they can learn and benefit from on these. Yeah. And it, you know, there's a lot of sports where there's not a high risk of injury too. Yeah. Right. And FFA is a, a great example to develop leadership skills as well, you know, but I, I just, I'm so passionate. I mean, I, I've seen it with my own kids and just, you know, the people they've become. And I attribute all that to their experiences in youth sports and, and being in a community and a school and uh, parents. And I think my own upbringing, I, I attribute a lot of my success to the things learned along the way. And so leadership is so critical and we're all leaders. Leadership is simply defined as influence. And if you think mm -hmm. of leadership as influence, we all influence our communities, our schools, our teams, our families, our classrooms when we walk into them, our body language influences, our attitude influences. There's, we all have leadership. It's on a continuum and we need to grow and develop that because it's a, it's a lifelong process. I'm still growing as a leader. You're still growing as a leader. And it, that's the beauty of it. Uh, the beauty lies in the process. You, you talked about, you know, part of co uh, a coach, one of the major functions is developing culture. And I do believe that that is such a central thing that if you're developing that culture of access, culture of leadership, it's going to help do it. But parents can also develop that kind of culture at home. So someone's listening to us and they say, you guys are talking about these ambiguous theories and stuff. Help me out here. What would be a step one for a parent to help create a culture in their home as they want to train young leaders in their house? I mean, what is a step one? Yeah, some, somebody's listening has got a... Uh, a 13 year old or 12 year old. And they're like, you know, I want little Johnny or Susie to, to be all that they can be and be a person of influence. What's the step? You know, I, I wrote a, I've written two books on culture on called culture wins one culture wins two. Um, I'm a math teacher by trade and I taught some pretty high level math classes. And so, you know, when I'm teaching, you know, I was teaching a calculus class, for example, and you have to take a very complex topic. And how do you simplify that? That's the art of teaching. Well, culture is a very complex topic. Leadership is a very complex topic. How do you simplify it? So for me, how I simplify culture is I, it's three simple things. And you can apply this at home when you're with your kids and your family. You can apply it in a school. You can apply it on a team. Culture is what you allow. Culture is what you emphasize and culture is every day. And so what hey, could you repeat that for our audience in case somebody just missed it up? Culture is what you allow. Okay. Culture is what you emphasize and culture is every day. What I allow are our standards, expectations, 
rules, if you may be, but really our, our standards, what, what we expect. I'll give you an example. As a high school principal, if I'm walking down the hall and I see a, a student talking to his buddy and he swears, okay, yeah. maybe they're just chit-chatting with each other. I have a choice to make. Am I going to intervene and say something? Doesn't mean I'm going to discipline the student, but I'm going to address it and let them know that that's not what we expect out of kids. That's not a behavior that we want. If I have that conversation and address it, I am helping set a standard of our culture of what we want. If I don't address it, they know I walked by, I heard, I didn't say anything. I am impacting our culture. You can apply that at home. You can apply that in a school. You can apply that on your team. What do you allow? And really think of all the things you allow. If you allow people to show up late every day, what does that turn into? And then it's what you emphasize. You can't emphasize everything. This was a, a mistake I probably made as a young coach. I tried to, I tried to do too much. And the longer I've been in it, the more I've realized less is more, uh, scale back, pull back. And, and so what do you really emphasize? I can tell you in our school, we emphasize three things, positive attitude, best effort, respect others. That's it. We have rules and you have policies, but in the, in the end, if you have a good attitude, if you give your best effort and you respect other people, that's going to solve 99% of all the issues and it's going to make you a happy and healthy you know, person on a team, you know, I have the, the same thing. One of our uh, three biggies is no deposit, no return, which is this concept of uh, you get what you earn. You're going to get out of life what you put into it. You're going to get out of basketball what you put into it. One is I want you to be a positive energy giver. Uh, I, I don't want negative energy. I don't want negative body language. That is contagious and it affects other people. It affects the team. And number three is the concept of we over me, uh, team mm -hmm. first. And I just say, you know, if, if we have uh, kids that have a no deposit, no return mindset, in other words, they believe everything is earned and we're going to work for things. If they are positive energy givers and they have a team first mindset, we're going to be okay. I mean, if we have that, we're going to be okay. Um, and, and so that's the big things that I emphasize in our culture. So what do you allow? What do you emphasize? And then the most important is every day you have to keep molding that culture every day because a culture isn't just set and then you walk away. A culture is ongoing. And so if you're not, I mean, they're high school kids, they're going to try to push the envelope. They, that's just how they're wired. Right. And so are you going to allow things to happen? Are you going to keep emphasizing what's important to you? And are you going to do that every day? And you could apply that in a home. You could apply that in a school. You could apply that in life, but that's how I define culture uh, in pretty simple terms. I appreciate that so much. I was in the classroom for almost a decade and I was thinking when you were going through that, the thought that was coming through my mind was what I consider my weakest year. And I think I, it was really number one on what you said culture was. I was allowing more than I should have allowed. I was probably being a little bit lazy uh, on what, what I was allowed. And, and I was just speaking with uh, Jen uh, Henson, who was also on our summit this past summer recently, and we were talking about teaching. And, and she was talking about, I only had maybe four bad days in my 22 year teaching career. And I said, I probably had double that and I had half the amount of time. I, I said, but if I reflect on it, it's all self-induced. And now that you've said that, I understand a little bit more. I was allowing the culture to de denigrate to something. Like that. That's significant. Um, it's simplifying a very complex topic. I think a lot of people think of culture and they think we're going to sit in a circle and we're going to you know, kumbaya type. That's not what culture <laughs> is, right? Culture is the feeling you get when you walk in a building, walk in a home, walk in a team. How does it run? How does it work? How do people feel? What are the expectations? What, you know, it's, it's a deep, deep process. And so how do you simplify that? And that's really what I've narrowed it down to. So when you've come back as a coach now, what are you doing to, to do that type of stuff in culture? I mean, what is, what are some of the practical things that you do to, to help establish that kind of culture there. That's just for me. I don't know if anybody else is interested, but James is very interested. So. Yeah. I mean, I, I re, like I told you before, I was able to replace a hall of fame basketball coach and we've continued and we've had some really good success. We're in a small town. I mean, we graduate a hundred kids per grade. We're not part of this huge school. What I'm most proud of as a coach is the consistency we've had year after year, because we don't recruit kids. We have, they're all homegrown. You know, they're our own kids. And, and part of the benefit of developing a culture 
is I get to know these kids in second, third, fourth grade when they're coming to basketball camps. You know, I am very purposeful in all my relationships that I'm establishing with parents, with kids, with our school, knowing that, and it's no different than parenting. All the work in parenting is done when kids are little. When they get up to high school, I'm sorry, it's kind of too late in a lot of regard. You can't all of a sudden decide to parent when a kid becomes 16. You know, that has to be done early. You have to lay that foundation because it's not easy. I mean, high school is not an easy time for parents. It's not an easy time for kids. It's much easier if you lay a really good foundation when they're young of what you allow, what you emphasize, what's important to you um, so that you can address those struggles, those challenges they have later on. And, you know, so from a basketball perspective, we just been fortunate to have a good culture and then maintain that. And again, that's the everyday piece. What do I allow? What do I emphasize? And am I doing that each and every day? And then the second thing is how do I purposely build leaders? How do I, how do I bring kids up in our program? Because I know player led teams win. Um, I know at a young age who the tone setters are going to be in our program and teams. I can tell. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm developing a relationship very early with them. And I am molding them with my discussions that I have every day, just kind of guiding them on those expectations and teaching what it is to be a leader, very subtle ways, so that by the time they get up to the varsity level, they are the type of person that we need to help be a leader on our team. And is it perfect? No. But in most cases, we got good kids and good positions that lead in the right way. And I, I think a lot of our success is attributed to that. Wow. I love this this concept. I don't think enough people recognize that that those types of cultural things, they're going to be, uh, that youth are not only going to experience that in a school setting, in an athletic setting, but it's going to be their life. It's going to be a part of, of who they are. Many of them are going to go over to companies that are going to be all about, you know, company culture. And they may not have the, the, the way of, of breaking that complex down in, into this uh, formula that, that you shared with us as well, but they're still going to hear that. So training them so early on to be excellent in that realm is, is going to set them apart so much uh, for this. And all those skills that they learn being part of a team, you know, when they go and work in that business, I mean, it's the same. It's what's your role? How are you going to sacrifice mm-hmm. for the betterment of the team? How are you going to bring positive energy to have help, you know, set that culture and how are you going to be a good leader? And those are all skills that you learn through youth sports and through being on a team, whatever team it may be. And so those skills are critical for us to teach young people today. Um, And like I said, team sports is one of the best ways to learn those. Well, I want you to think back to the uh, Ignite Summit that you did. You shared with us some great content, some six principles and stuff. For the audience that may not have joined with us, even though they've heard about it, I don't know why they wouldn't <laughs> have done it, but they didn't didn't want to, did not participate in stuff. Pick one of those things that's your favorite one, if you can think back to, to what you shared with us. Um, and, and, and just, I started to give you one, you know, and I wrote some down. And I was like, oh, let me give one and let me do it. And I was like, nah, let, let, me, let me choose this favorite one and, and share with that with us uh, so that uh, they can get a taste of what they missed out on. I think the most powerful one, I really just heard this a couple of years ago, and it, it is so true. It resonated with me so well. And it is um, what I've termed or heard as the secret. And, and what is the, the secret? It's really the secret to success, the secret to being happy, the secret to being successful. And it is just because you have a negative thought does not mean you have to believe it. I'll say that again. Just because you have a negative thought does not mean you have to believe it. The most successful people have learned to talk to themselves instead of listen to themselves. It is human nature to have negative thoughts creep into our head. The human brain wants to keep us alive. So Mm -hmm. it tells us don't, you know, negative thoughts, don't step in front of a train, don't walk in front of a car, don't walk off the bridge, whatever it may be. Those are negative thoughts saying, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. That's how the brain works. It's very normal to get negative thoughts creep into your brain. The most successful people can filter that. And they know that, you know, I'll give you just basketball examples. I mean, 
Uh, we had a, an athlete, we had an incredible game against uh, Minneapolis North last uh, November. And Minneapolis, we're both ranked. We're both top five teams in the state. And we're playing at, you know, a couple games going on side by side up at, up at Hopkins High School. And we, we had built a 20 point lead at half, you know, we're kind of just in coast mode and, and Minneapolis North started picking up the pressure, the full court pressure. And they started kind of creeping back and got closer and closer. And all of a sudden, all these fans came over to our court and it was like watching LeBron James kids play an AAU game where the whole court is like six deep surrounded you know, watching our game and all of a sudden our, our point guard followed out with about two minutes to go. And so mm-hmm. there, this ball pressure is picking up and now we lost our primary ball handler. And the next thing, you know, Minneapolis North hits a free throw to go up one with eight seconds to go. And we get the rebound off the second missed free throw and our kids push it down the court and the place is going wild. And one of our players gets the ball pump fakes, gets fouled. He's going to the free throw line with like two seconds left. Uh, down one with probably, I don't know, a couple thousand people, you know, at this gym. And he proceeds to go up there and just doesn't even hit the rim on his two free throws, makes both of them. We end up winning the game. And, you know, I talked to him after and and his mindset was, you know, I was just thinking about shooting free throws and practice with David coach. I mean, he's got all these people. He's got all these negative thoughts that could have easily crept into his mind. Okay, but he was able to filter that. And just because you have a negative thought doesn't mean you have to believe it. And he shifted his mindset. He shifted that negative energy into a positive and and won the game. And there's not a lot of people that can do that. You know, all that negative stuff that comes in, how do you turn that into a positive? And I, I just think that's really the secret to life because life is hard. There's a lot of things that happen. There's a lot of adversity. There's a lot of struggle. And the most successful people are able to do this. And so how do we, how do we learn that skill? It's not easy, but I I think it's, it's an incredibly valuable skill. So just because you have a negative thought does not mean you have to believe it. Uh, Learn to talk to yourself instead of listen to yourself. God, that is so important, Greg. I mean, we, we've uh, interviewed over 2,500 youth over the past few years and asked them, you know, what they thought their biggest problem were facing their generation, categorized them based on the commonalities. And the answer really came down with three major uh, topics. And the biggest one was they're struggling with self-image. And I think a lot of it is having to do with what you just said on that secret is they're believing every negative thought that is coming in about themselves and is destroying how they see themselves. They don't, the value of who they are and who they were created to be. And wow, what a, what a powerful, but simple. It's almost so simple. It it is going to be hard for some to accept and do. Would you agree with me on that or am I way off base on that? Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it's an easy thing. I'm just saying that you know, and social media does not help with all these negative thoughts, right? I mean, yeah. negative things put in. And so how do you filter that? And how do you, I just know that the people that are able to do that are the people that tend to be the happiest and most successful oftentimes. So what is the trick? How are they able to do that? Is it, you know, and, and this is where I think the team sports things or what, you know, being a part of something bigger than yourself, being a part of a community and building confidence in yourself and, and all of that are so incredibly important because they teach these skills that build confidence in kids and allow them to overcome those negative thoughts that might creep into their, into their brains. So there's a lot that goes into it. Any tip or or recommendation? I'm thinking right now, somebody screaming at their pod, at their podcast app right now saying, I want to learn how to do this to help my kids. (laughs) What do I do today? What can I do every day? I mean, to me, everything starts with attitude, you know, your attitude Mm -hmm. towards things. And if you have a positive growth based attitude, uh, when you have negative things happen, you're generally going to try to take the positive spin on that. And I think that, you know, when you look at things in a positive way, uh, you're always going to grow and learn and develop from that. And I think that is aligned with this concept of the secret. You have a negative thought come in well, how can I spin this into a positive? So that attitude uh, and your choice of your attitude is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. Everything starts with that 
attitude. I think when you look at failure, some of the things I love about failure, Kobe Bryant said he doesn't believe in failure because failure is just feedback to him on what he needs to continue to grow and develop. In other words, it's all part of the process. I think when we say failure, kids interpret it, people interpret it as it's, it's an end. Like failure is a finality. No, failure is just part of the process. It's, it's part of feedback to grow. And so uh, one thing that I hear a lot and I like is failure is growth. You know, Mm -hmm. if you don't do something well, it's just an opportunity to grow and learn. Well, that's, that's that same mindset of the secret. That's that same positive attitude. When you have something negative happen, how are you going to respond to that? If you take a positive attitude approach to that, I think that moves you in the right direction. It reminds me of two uh, quotes from Zig Ziglar, who was, you know, we were originally called Generation Ziglar before we moved over. And my favorite one is, you are what you are and where you are by what goes into your mind. You can change what you are. You can change where you are by changing what goes into your mind. I mean, that just feeds. It defines really the same. It's the same concept. Um, We are what we think, you know, and everything thought, you know, begins with those thoughts. Thoughts lead to words, lead to actions, you know, lead to habits. You know, you've probably seen that, that quote, but those thoughts can be negative. And so the, the secret is to filter out the negative, make them positive. And then that moves you in the right direction. I think, you know, life is really about creating habits. When you really break it down, our day-to-day habits and what we choose to do mm-hmm. move us in a direction. And it's, it's like Newton's law of motion. You know, all you have to do is set something in motion and it will continue to, to, to grow. And if you put good habits in motion, if you put a good attitude in motion and you make good decisions and you put those in motion, better things start to happen. I, you know, I, I'll attribute it to the, my writing. Okay. Remember in high school, I, I decided to, uh, to write about 16 months ago. I, I'm not a writer. I'm a math guy, but I've always had all this stuff in my, in my brain. And I've always wanted to, I've always wanted to do something like this since I was in college. I just didn't know what it would be, but I've always wanted to actually, I wrote goals when I was in college of things I wanted to accomplish. And one of them, the first ones I wrote was something with what I'm doing right now, leadership, coaching, um, Mm -hmm. professional growth, all of that. And so I I started writing and I, I took a course that gave me a process to begin. And I had 500 followers in, uh, March of 2022. And so I just started writing. And today I have 24,000 followers. I didn't even know what a newsletter was. And I decided to start a newsletter. That was my next progression. So about two months later, I started a newsletter. I now have uh, almost 8,000 people reading my newsletter and I'm writing actionable ideas about coaching, leadership, culture, and teams. I wrote four books in the last year. I mean, I'm, I'm not a writer, but I'm saying all this and I wrote this team leader OS because Newton's first law, I just started something in motion. I had no idea where it was going to go. I started tweeting every day and what that has done and the doors it has opened for me, I I mean, I could have never predicted and it's still happening today. I mean, I'm talking with you. I would have never predicted I'd be talking with you. I would have never predicted I created this team leader OS. I don't know what's next, but all I know is is the trajectory and the growth all ha- all started because of a habit that I started. And so habits create motion where different things happen. And I think we can attribute that to attitude. We can attribute that to mindset and just focus on your habits. Little things. Little things lead to big things. So we got to focus on the little things first. It, it strikes me as, as uh, being a lesson that we need to learn is those things that that we're taught during school through science and math classes have universal applications that we don't even see uh, that we could, we could sit and pontificate about all the different formulas that we learn and, and principles and theories and, and laws and that are supposed to be strictly about physics or science or mathematics. But as you just have shown, they have so much more implications about life in general. Uh, that would be a great book. Uh, you know, <laughs> taking some of the, taking some of those things like you were talking about Newton's law and, and showing how science is really life 
in those aspects. So, there you know, next book and stuff, you can put me in the credits. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, well, how can our audience uh, connect with you to, to learn more about what you do, uh, connect with your newsletter, and just and just find out everything they need to? Yeah, I mean, I you have my website listed right there, gb1leadership.com. That is going to have links to you know, my books, my newsletter is right on the front page of that to sign up. Uh, and my team leader OS is right there as well. Like I said, the parent version, and it's really the athlete version. It's the athlete version of the team leader OS, but it's one that I really want to market, uh, to parents for parents to, to get this for their son or daughter. And, you know, I, I say <laughs> parents will spend so much money to provide skill development in a sport for their son or daughter. They'll spend hundreds upon hundreds of dollars to, you know, go get a personal workout here or there. We need to take a little bit of that and apply it to leadership and develop, you know, don't just rely on a teacher or a school to do that. I mean, they, obviously we all have roles as coaches and teachers, but as a parent, you know, take the initiative and, and help develop, you know, your son or daughter. And that's really my goal with that. So I'm close to having that, that part of it done. I'll release that coming up on Twitter. Um, I'm at GB 1121. That's my handle on Twitter. I, I post uh, multiple times per day, two to three to four times per day, actionable ideas on leadership, culture, uh, coaching and teams. So, uh, you can go to the website and get probably most of the, the stuff that you would need. Well, Greg, I certainly appreciate uh, your time with us today, taking time out of your busy schedule. School's just kicking back in up in, in, in Minnesota. So you guys started what last week, I guess. Is that yeah, right? we started right after Labor Day. So we're, we're into week two and we're, we're starting to hit our groove right now. I've worked with enough Minnesota uh, students over the years to know about when your school starts and enough about what the state fair means to that state's culture and, and why schools are, there are a little bit delayed compared to some of the other states uh, uh, of when they start. So I, I was like, wow, he's, he's, <laughs> you got a busy time going on uh, on those days. So It's quite a fair. <laughs> that's what I understand. So, well, thank you for being part of it. And audience, all of those links uh, to Greg's uh, website and his social media channels are going to be in the show notes. So if you're listening just go to your favorite podcast app that you're uh, using right now and you'll find those. If you're watching us on YouTube, as always, just look down and you'll see it in the show notes. So, Greg, thank you for being our guest today. Thank you for being a part of the summit. I really value what you're doing. I, it is so important and it's so timely and, and it speaks speaks to my heart and my mission as well. So thank you for that. Thank you. And thank you for what you do as well. I really appreciate the opportunity. Hey, and listen, audience, if you've stuck with us this long, you obviously found a lot of value in what you're hearing. So please like and share and comment on this podcast and especially share because there, if you've listened to us this long, there's someone that you know that needs to hear this message and get the value out of it too. So please share it with them. And we'll see you right back here really soon on the Generation Youth Podcast.